It's time for Branding Business, the only show that brings branding experts and corporate executives together to explore how branding your business can improve both your top-line growth and bottom-line performance. Brought to you by Rikus Baird. And now, here's your host. Welcome to Branding Business with Rikus Baird. I'm Ryan Rikus, and today's topic is international branding. Our first guest is Steve Holly, Global Director of Sales Development at Oakley. Here's a little background on Steve, 20-year veteran of the sporting goods, consumer products, and retailing industries. Over his career, he has uh, a lot of experience in retailing, marketing, strategic planning, sales force effectiveness, finance, M&A, and general management with some big brands like Macy's, Coca-Cola, Mars Master Foods, Nordstrom's, Earthlink.com, ExxonMobil, and Chevron. Currently, at Oakley, He's Global Director of Sales Development. There, he leads the company efforts in accelerating sales and profitabilities in mature and developing markets around the world. Steve's primarily efforts focus on driving incremental sell-in and sell-through in something he calls the last mile. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Happy to uh, happy to talk to you today. Great. Well, I'm uh, sure our guests are very interested in what you have to say. Maybe we can begin with, even though I give you a little overview of what your title says you do, maybe you can give us a, a viewpoint as Global Director of Sales Development, uh, a little bit more information about your role today. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. So um, the, the role that, that uh, I and my team play in uh, Oakley's uh, go-to-market strategy is the, the last mile. It is uh, when consumers walk into uh, retailers to make a purchase or consider making a purchase, if you think of the, the four-wall retail environment and what is their experience in that, in that purchasing environment uh, and how can Oakley partner with our accounts in a more substantive way to deliver an authentic Oakley uh, branded experience at the point of sale. And so we look to pull levers of uh, influencing the shopping environment, influencing and working with the sales associates that sell the product, and then, of course, uh, maximizing and and optimizing our relationship and our partnership with the the valuable retailers that distribute our product around the world. Well, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper on, on, on all that, but maybe to begin with, uh, do you mind sharing with us? I know you're not in brand management. I understand that. Maybe you can share with us a little bit of the, the viewpoint on uh, what the Oakley brand stands for today. Absolutely. Um, so I'll uh, I'll give you my two cents on the Oakley brand. Uh, I personally have been a loyalist for the Oakley brand for 20 years before joining uh, Oakley. So the brand uh, the brand is near and dear to my heart. You know we're uh, we're known uh, obviously most well for our sunglasses, but at our core. We are a uh, technology innovation and design company, and uh, we apply that those core platforms to any products or, or cultural uh, endeavors that we uh, participate in. So. As I think of uh, the Oakley brand, I think of uh, working with our athletes, our professional athletes in the environments uh, where they're performing and their performance matters most and making sure that uh, our R&D teams and our design teams are uh, developing products that enhance their performance. Of course, we always wrap that in our sort of iconic design and art and really offer a, a unique uh, experience uh, in terms of product and the, and the cultural brand that surrounds that to our to our consumers, you know, as a as an example, the, the Tour de France is going on right now, and we have a, a pretty sizable team there, uh, from designers to uh, obviously the people that partner with our with our athletes, working with our athletes both in the in the pre-race prep and then uh, even uh, during the race to understand uh, the needs of the uh, the equipment that uh, that we work with those athletes on. Truly, when it matters most at the height of competition, and I think anyone would argue that the Tour de France is the pinnacle of cycling competition. So, so is it just just an example? The the brand is really one of technology, innovation, and design. And even though you're mostly known for sunglasses, you're in a lot of other different categories. That same concept applies, obviously, to these other categories, then, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're right, and and people know us for our sunglasses and our in our history. We were a lot of people don't know that we were actually founded. Uh, we were founded by Jim Gennard, and he was uh, in pharmacy school at the time and decided to to take a side job uh, selling uh, motorcycle parts and equipment to r- motorcycle racers, and. Uh, Really, it's a it's a story that that can communicate kind of our heritage. At the time, the the motorcycle racers were out racing in the hot sun, and their hands would get sweaty, and the, there were accidents happening, and people didn't feel like they were at their their 
peak performance because their hands were slipping off the handlebars as they wrestled with their motorcycles. And he said, well, I think we can develop a basically a rubber technology that gets stickier when it gets wet. So as you get sweatier, it gets stickier. We, uh, he developed it and, and branded it unobtainium. And to this day, we still use that, basically that rubber uh, polymer in all of uh, many of our products. So it was an example of us taking a, a need in the marketplace as expressed to help performance, uh, developing a solution against it, and coming to market with grips, in this case, handlebar grips, our first product, to meet that need and enhance the performance of, of those athletes. So a lot of people know us for our sunglasses. We started in motorcycle grips. We moved into motocross goggles that were much the same. Our athletes uh, at the time had some very specific needs that weren't being met by the marketplace. We moved from there into sunglasses, uh, have uh, obviously built uh, quite a, a brand around sunglasses uh, from a technology and innovation perspective, uh, also from design, uh, have moved into many different categories, as you mentioned, Ryan. Some of the, the big ones, uh, obviously, are our apparel business. If you talk about like technical apparel in the winter, ski jackets uh, or skiing or snowboarding, uh, powder pants, etc., we have a, an amazing line of those, and some of the most iconic competitive athletes in the world rely on our apparel technology. You talk about uh, for example, blade board short. Uh, we think it's one of the most innovative products around right now. Uh, very innovative for surfers with a, with a compression liner to allow you to perform uh, longer and more comfortably in the water. So uh, we, we uh, have a number of different products from footwear to accessories to apparel, uh, watches and whatnot. Well, great. That's a great background sharing the thought of how technology and innovation has been a foundation for the brand from the very beginning and certainly where you're taking it today. So... I think it's very helpful, and thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Well, well back on the on the topic of global branding, Oakley was bought by an Italian company, Lexotica, a number of years back, uh, which is a fashion house, a uh, number of brands. And maybe you can describe their <clears throat> viewpoint to a brand strategy and how their brands work together and how much oversight they have or how little oversight they have with you guys. Yeah, Luxottica in uh, Italy bought Oakley a few years ago, and uh, I think it's been a great relationship so far. No uh, no end in the great relationship in sight. Uh, it's really been a, a, a good partnership. As Luxottica, you know, uh, looked at the Oakley brand and the Oakley product line and the Oakley team, I think there were some, uh, some real enhancing characteristics and capabilities as they thought about their company and their portfolio of products. Um, as you as you mentioned, uh, Luxottica is largely known as a as a fashion house, and so they they have you know some of the most iconic fashion brands uh, from from Ray Ban to uh, their uh, the Chanel brand, Dolce and Gabbana, uh, Prada, and uh, Persol, some of the other brands, really amazing fashion brands. They didn't have that uh, iconic sport brand in their portfolio, and so uh, bringing uh, Oakley into their portfolio was a real enhancement to that lineup. Uh, with the Oakley brand, I think uh, they've been they've been pretty uh, complimentary that they also got some other really important uh, aspects of the business from from our R and D capabilities, obviously our understanding of the sport channel, the sport distribution, and sporting goods stores with uh, authenticity around around athlete relationships and those types of things. So I think it's been a, it's been a great relationship so far. We actually uh, now manage a couple other brands in, in their portfolio with Revo and Arnett. So the Oakley team, uh, I think, has had a, a great experience so far, really happy being part of the family. And I hopefully, I, I won't speak for the Lexotica team, but hopefully we've, we've also been good partners in, in adding those other capabilities and, uh, and things to their, their repertoire. Well, perfect. Thanks for that that overview, and I hope they continue to uh, give you the flexibility you guys need in order to continue to drive the brand forward. It sounds like they oh, yeah. will. So I didn't I didn't quite answer your your question. I apologize. So in terms of their their oversight of Oakley, we've been uh, we've been very fortunate, I think, in that partnership. Uh, it's been a very it's been a very two way relationship. Uh, that we've certainly learned things from them, and they they allow us to uh, bring our expertise to the places that that it matters most, and we obviously leverage their expertise expertise where it matters most. Our, if, you, if you talk about our, our optics categories, if you talk about sunglasses, ophthalmic um, eyeglass frames, uh, prescription lenses, and things like that, um, a lot of those products are sold in, in what we call the optical channel. And, you, know, you can think of the optical channel as the places you go to get your eyes tested and get corrective vision glasses, right? the doctor's offices, etc. 
In the optical channel, Luxottica has really made a, uh, an amazing set of relationships with the optical channel and the dealers in the optical channel. So they really bring a lot of expertise uh, around um, around execution, partnership, etc. in that channel. Oakley obviously was founded in the sporting goods channel uh, with uh, the elite sporting goods stores, the core sports stores, etc. So we believe we bring a lot of expertise around the sporting goods channel. And as Luxottica has opportunities to uh, distribute through the sporting goods channel, we help them with our expertise and vice versa. So they've really, I think, it, from my perspective, respected our knowledge around sporting goods and given us that latitude to, to really take the sporting goods business to the next level, as well as in a very cooperative way, uh, lent their support of helping us uh, execute in a more meaningful way with our accounts in the, in the optical uh, channel as well. Fantastic. Sounds like it's been a great partnership. So, um, well, Steve, let's get back to your, your role specifically of global business development. And maybe you can speak a little bit about your role in evaluating new markets. I mean, Oakley's, I, I've, I've traveled the world. I see Oakley wherever I go, but uh, I'm sure you're always looking to explore new markets for introduction. Absolutely. So, um, you know, like like many companies, we have uh, many U.S. companies. We have a, a fairly uh, mature business in the U.S. We have high brand awareness, thanks to our uh, very loyal athletes and, and consumers that uh, that enjoy the Oakley brand and participate uh, in sport. We have developing markets as any do. Um, so uh, we have, uh, you know, opportunities for uh, to build uh, the brand in other markets. We look at the the big emerging market geographies as anyone does. Um, I was in Brazil a couple couple months ago, looking at that market, and I, I think it's no surprise to anyone with um, the World Cup coming to Brazil, the Olympics, the Summer Olympics coming to Brazil. That is a, a market that is getting world attention, is absolutely exploding, and like uh, like all major global brands, we, we certainly look at the BRIC countries, the you know, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, big emerging middle, uh, middle class purchasing power uh, companies, uh, all with, with great affinity for, for what brands and, uh, and technology can bring to, their, to enhancing their performance with products. So uh, Brazil is a, uh, a big opportunity for us. Uh, we have, a, we have a, thankfully, a strong brand in Brazil, I mean, we're really uh, excited about uh, executing there. We are going and spending uh, more and more investment in understanding how to execute, and, and we're actually learning from Luxottica in many ways about executing in, in India and China and, uh, and Russia as well. So uh, we, we evaluate those sort of emerging markets very closely. We have other, other markets, if you think of uh, Australia, Japan, many, you know, Canada, etc., that we, we feel we can and we can really have uh, meaning. We do have meaningful businesses, and we'll continue to uh, invest in those businesses. Uh, but big, big opportunities for us. Well, I know Oakley has your own re- retail stores, but most of your sales are through you know B two B relationships with retailers around around the world. Maybe you can describe your approach to building uh, these relationships so they're ongoing and successful. And so, how do you make them? Last and and grow and continue to be successful. Well, I think I think the you're absolutely right. We do have retail stores, and uh, personally, as a consumer, I love going into our retail stores because you really have a an immersive brand environment. You see our entire uh, catalog of products, from you know watches to footwear to our apparel, and of course our sunglasses and whatnot. So I really love going into our we call them our O stores, our Oakley stores. But you're absolutely right. We have uh, the vast majority. Of our of our distribution is through uh, wholesale partners out there, and I think uh, as you ask about how we maintain those relationships and, and think about that, I think it comes from our from our heritage, uh, where I, I spoke a minute ago about about the founding of the company and how we, how we grew through grips and then goggles and then sunglasses. I think we we try to uh, try to be humble and remember our roots. Or I personally feel that brands can go the opposite direction and get uh, overly confident and think that uh, now that we, we have an established brand, we no longer need to worry so much about the partnerships. But culturally, we believe that uh, that partnership with our wholesale accounts, the retailers that resell our product, is fundamental to, to our success. You think so much about the Oakley brand, uh, we think about it as authenticity. We want, to be, we want to be authentic. We want to be authentic with professional athletes. We want to be authentic with um, aspirational athletes that uh, aspire to the level of performance of professional athletes, etc. So 
when we talk about connecting with our consumers, uh, the users of our product, we truly need to leverage those relationships with, with our retailers. And so going back to the foundations, what does that mean? Uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly establishing a two-way dialogue. It's uh, partnering and giving those retailers the tools to communicate the Oakley brand holistically. So it could be countertop tools that allow the sales associate to demonstrate the technology difference of our uh, HDO technology, our high-definition optics technology, where we have we've essentially have patents around the shape of the lenses that correct for for your vision, uh, even though our glasses are high wrap, high impact protection. So we need to deliver those tools to our partners so that they can, in turn, communicate the benefits of Oakley to the consumers that come into their store. So that's maybe an example of the tools that we bring to the table. Now, my team in, in particular, we think along the telephone game of how do we give our sales reps that are out in the field and, and visiting these accounts the tools to go in and engage the sales associates, the the kid behind the counter uh, potentially that works in these accounts and give them the knowledge and share the brand passion with them so that when the next consumer comes into the store, we're not just another brand. We're, we're a, a brand that can be communicated and all, with all of the passion, the research and development, and the technological differentiation that we, we truly uh, invest in every product we make. So you've worked with a lot of different lifestyle brands. Would you say Oakley takes this concept of giving the, the tools and the training to these kids behind the counter a uh, uh, different meaning at a different level? I mean, it seems that that's, you talk about the uh, you know, last mile, that's the critical component here. Yeah, I think I think the the difference. I think there are. Uh, I've, I've been so fortunate to work with many fantastic brands, and you know, obviously working with so many great brands, you you really you see the good, the bad, the ugly, and most importantly, I think you see places that maybe upstream there's great execution. You know, the fantastic product, fantastic brand uh, mapping, brand ideology, et cetera, uh, brand positioning. But then uh, sometimes the uh, downstream execution manifestation of that breaks down. And so the neat thing about Oakley is, I, I can say without question, the upstream product innovation, R&D, certainly the, the marketing and the, and the culture. We're, you know, I, I like to think that we're not a very intentionally marketed company. Marketing more emanate, uh, you know, comes from our our, our relationship with, with our athletes and, and truly our passion around the uh, research and development and the design of our product. Our culture emanates from that and our marketing emanates from that. But at Oakley, that upstream stuff is, is truly best in class, I believe. It is, uh, you know, I believe we lead consumer products and, and branding in that regard. So I believe our opportunity is to truly leverage that downstream and do a better job of telling stories, of communicating our authenticity all along the telephone game from our sales forces to our uh, the owners of our accounts to the sales associates the kid behind the counter and you know obviously then on to our consumers and so uh, I like to believe that we have the tools upstream and what what I try to do every day when I come to work is optimize that storytelling how do we get better and better at sharing the magic of Oakley with more and more of our, our, our sales associates and our consumers in the last mile? That's a huge challenge. It sounds like you're obviously doing a great job. And on top of that challenge, you sell through multiple channels, as you spoke about a moment ago. How, how do you ensure that same authentic brand experience is goes across these different channels as well. I come from a, a, a strategic background, so uh, as any good strategist would do, or maybe I, uh, I believe we have to break down the uh, the execution into component and manageable parts, and uh, you know build momentum through phasing. So uh, you're absolutely right. We distribute in many different channels, right? Uh, distributing and our, our relationships with, for example, bike retailers is different than a doctor that runs an optical shop or potentially a, uh, a running shop or a baseball shop, etc. a cricket shop in India, for example. So what we need to do is break them, break these relationships and these distribution channels down into their component parts, 
understand what their world of communication and, and brand communication is. And I personally believe we can't tweak the brand. The brand is what it is, the product, the innovation, the technology. And so we need to find different ways to communicate with these stories to different realities of distribution channels. So hopefully that isn't too esoteric. Where the rubber hits the road, it's actually very tactical. You know, if you think of um, our, our optical channel around the world, these are uh, typically a little bit older demographic. They're, they're um, optometrists, ophthalmologists, etc. They're very into and as they should be, the medical properties, the, the scientific properties of making sure that their patients are, you know, us as consumers, have optimum science and technology in, in maximizing your eyesight, right? So we need to speak to them in their language and give them the tools to communicate Oakley's R&D, authenticity, technological innovations in a way that's real to them and allows them to pass those as points, those details, that authenticity onto their patients. If you conversely go think of us uh, talking in a surf account, um, it's a different a different type of person. It's it's often kids behind the counter that are very very passionate about surfing or skateboarding or action sports in general. Well, we need to speak to them in a in a different way. Again, the the brand and the and the properties and the authenticity is exactly the same in both, but we're we're talking to them in different ways in a in an intentional way. You have to understand their needs and and their life and and the environment of those stores and and deliver uh, adapt our community communication to be relevant in their world. So it's it's sort of intentional, it's very segmented, and, and we try to always be great and, and respect the magic of these retail stores because at, at its core, retailing is an amazing, uh, an amazing sort of science. And these people understand their businesses so well, we need to say, how can we bring our authenticity to your retail environment in a way that it enhances your relationship with your consumers? And that's what we strive to do every single day. Well, as you said, it begins on a very strategic level and broken down into just numerous tactics that uh, you have to pay attention to day in and day out and provide these uh, various different channels, the tools they need in order to be successful. Maybe I could switch gears a little bit in the sense that uh, you know, I've been to your corporate headquarters, and it, it's an amazing facility that, I don't know, evokes this feeling of a mad scientist laboratory. And, and I know your culture is very unique and, and very important to you as well. Maybe you can speak to the importance of, uh, of culture in a business like Oakley. Yeah. I mean, at, at, at Oakley, it's really difficult for me to separate the ideas of, uh, of design, technology, innovation, and, and passionate culture because that's all one idea in my mind at Oakley. We, you know, everything we do can, can harken back to that example of, of our founder out there with elite athletes that had a need, we engineered the need, uh, or he in that case, one person engineered the need, uh, the solution to the need, and uh, the the amount of uh, motivation that that solving those needs of elite athletes uh, brings to a, a culture is just truly astounding. And so, um, as you talk about the Oakley culture, uh, the degree to which we're able to meet uh, the needs of our of our athletes, and that that can be elite athletes, it can be weekend warriors, it could be you know someone who's training for their first 5K. It's just an incredibly motivating aspect of our culture here, and so we all strive to do that every single day. Whether that be you know someone who's going snowboarding for the first time, how do we ensure that the jacket they're wearing doesn't leak, that it it has functional properties that enhance their experience. You know, venting when the when the clouds go away and the bluebird conditions come out and it warms up. How do we ensure that there's venting in that? How do we ensure that, um, for example, prescription sunglasses? Uh, a lot of people don't think of prescription sunglasses, but you have sunglasses. You can obviously get prescription lenses in them. Well, we have you know patented properties associated with our sunglass lenses, and you can get those same benefits in prescription through proprietary prescription. Oakley prescription lenses in your Oakley sunglasses, right? So we have a lot of passion around our true digital optics, for example, where we have custom prescription sunglasses that meet all the properties of your uh, of your RX that you get when you get your eye, eyes tested. So how does all that manifest itself in, in our culture? And, and you mentioned our building. 
it's just amazing. It's one of these places that uh, if if you've ever been a place worked in a place where you come to work every day and it's a it's a job. Well, Oakley's obviously a lot more than a job. The passion that everybody exhibits for the product, the innovation, etc., really manifests all all aspects of the culture. I was in uh, Japan a few months ago meeting with our, our team there, our fantastic team that we have in Japan. Obviously, our hearts have gone out to them with everything that, is, uh, that has happened in Japan this year. But I was there just before the, uh, the tsunami hit. And we were talking about uh, with a group of about 15 folks in our, in our Tokyo office. And three of them had been to the headquarters. And if anyone hasn't seen the Oakley headquarters, Google it online. Uh, it's a pretty pretty special place and one of these people that had been to our headquarters kind of stopped the conversation he said no i know a lot of you guys haven't been there but when you come around that turn it just stops you in your tracks you're like so proud of of everything that oakley stands for and and it, it you know our building communicates that and it's an inextricable part of our culture and uh it's so great to hear that when you when you travel the world and I'm so fortunate to visit some of our other subsidiaries and hear the passion that they have and we're able to communicate this cultural identity uh through the building through through the people and through the pride that everybody has in what we do so it's it's a really really special culture that that drives this place. Well, I've I've seen the culture in work and it it is pretty unique and, and pretty amazing. Steve, we're we're almost out of time. One last quick question, if there, if I can, what, what's the biggest challenge you have in maintaining a global brand? The biggest challenge in maintaining a global brand. Well, I, I uh, I'll take the question and, and and spin it a little bit because I think it, it, there's a, there is a challenge that global brands are facing, and I, I think it's also an opportunity, as any good strategist would say, I guess. So one of the things that's fundamentally changing in global branding is obviously uh, transparency of branding with uh, with the internet and and real time communication. And, and social media and whatnot. So uh, if we think back 20 years ago and you take some of the greatest brands in the world, they actually meant very different things from market to market. There was a, a localization of the brand from market to market. Well, whether brands today like want to do that intentionally or not, it's getting very difficult to do that. And, and you know, on the one hand, you could view it as difficult. On the other hand, you could view it as it is much easier to create a powerful global brand if you're trying to drive you know experience authenticity you know whatever your your intentions of your brand are so you know from my perspective with uh, open communications and the internet social media etc there are challenges in ensuring that you're you're sort of uh, authentic in all of these different markets with these different consumers and different cultures etc um, but it's also on the other hand much easier to have that powerful uniformity of what you stand for as a company. And it doesn't matter what brand you talk about, any of the great uh, consumer brands. You know, if you if you talk about Apple or or uh, any number of extraordinary consumer brands, at their core they have a set of values uh, that are really foundationally important to them and the degree to which they can communicate that uh, that power and that passion uh, uniformly to all of those consumers around the world is uh, is to a large degree uh, how they'll be successful and so i think uh, i think globalization transparency and communication are really bringing a lot to that that brand communication uh, toolbox these days well that was perfect steve just a few of takeaways that I learned today was that a, a brand like Oakley is, is firmly founded on sustainable attributes. Um, they were by Jim Gennaro at the beginning of product innovation, uh, complete dedication to performance, uh, a unique approach design, but all built around a, a culture, an internal culture of passion. And when you have that unique combination, you can uh, go, be, go beyond your core product and go into brand extensions. And you can go beyond brand extensions into global markets as well. But at the same time, it really takes a significant resources beyond marketing, things like tools and training to, to really make retail success work and, and really to have that right combination at the, uh, at retail and what you call the last mile. And that's ultimately where, where success resides. So Steve, you've been a fantastic guest. Uh, thank you for the terrific insights. I really appreciate it. Steve, if, if uh, any of our listeners want to get a hold of you, how, how would they reach you? Uh, they can reach me over email. It's uh, S is in Sam, H O L L E Y, at uh, oakley.com, O A K L E Y, and I'd you know, be happy to hear from anybody interested in speaking. Perfect. Thank you so much for today. I uh, really appreciate it. Great insights. 
Thanks so much, Ryan. Really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. Well, you've been listening to Branding Business with Rika Spirit. To learn more about our show, please visit brandingbusiness.com. We'll be right back with our next guest after this quick commercial break. There's something happening out there today. All across America, we're seeing encouraging signs of economic recovery. Businesses are once again thinking about new growth, and new opportunities are emerging. But it raises the question, is your company positioned to take full advantage of the economic recovery and the opportunities it presents? Maybe it's time to ask, how has the recession impacted your business model? Is your business as relevant as it once was? Should you consider entering new markets or expanding into new categories? And what do customers really value about their relationship with you? The golden thread through all these questions and the answer to each and every one of them can be found in just one place. Your brand. It's much deeper than your logo and much bigger than your advertising. Your brand is the enabler of your entire business strategy. Rika's Baird is a brand strategy firm that can help. They specialize in business branding. They've helped hundreds of companies from startups to Fortune 500 leverage their brands to drive growth. They can do the same for yours. It's really quite simple. Find out more, just visit brandingbusiness.com. That's www.brandingbusiness.com. And plant the seed for economic growth. And now back to Ryan and his next guest. Welcome to Branding Business, brought to you by Rika Spirit. I am Ryan Rikas, and today's show topic is international branding. Our next guest is Constantine von Bach, Director of Marketing and Sales USA and Canada for Villaway and Bach. Let me first tell you some background on the company, and then Constantine. Villaway and Bach was founded over 260 years ago in 1748, and has developed into a true international lifestyle brand with representation in over 125 countries. You might know them from their beautiful tableware, but they also have two other significant divisions, the bath and wellness, as well as decorative tiles. The company is headquartered in Metlock, Germany, at a point where France, Luxembourg, and Germany meet. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to join Constantine at their international headquarters, which is based in a a former Benedictine abbey with some buildings over a 1,000 years old. It's an amazing facility, and it's a perfect setting for such an honored brand like uh, V&B. Constantine von Bach is obviously a descendant of one of the original two families, yet I know for a fact he didn't immediately ascend to an executive position, but I'll let him tell you more about that story. Constantine, welcome to Branding Business. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for having me on this show. And um great being with you today. Well, um, let me just open up my first question and let me ask you, tell us about your background, and how, how it was growing up in the Bach family and your introduction into the business and then that could lead into your current role at Villa and Bach today. Yes, I mean, it's a Villa and Bach, as, as, as you already mentioned, is a very exciting company and brand. Uh, it's a family-owned company still today, um, actually representing the ninth generation. Doing business uh, with family and in a family environment is a, is a great tra- uh, challenge and a, a great honorable uh, tradition to keep up. It's not always easy. As you can imagine, biz- families uh, are not always all in the same opinion. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, tradition to be able to keep this uh, family business running and, and passing it on to the next generation. And this is something that already highlights one of the aspects of Wilhelm Boch. It is a company that does not so much think in quarters and reporting the next figures, but it thinks in generations. And I think this is one of the success factors that has brought us to, to, the, to today's position, uh, where we still have family members involved in the company, where the ownership even though we are listed on, on the stock market in Frankfurt, uh, the ownership is still in, in the hands of the family. I joined the company about uh, seven years ago. I, I just on a side note, Wurmbach actually has a very strict, uh, rules, very strict rules and regulations about family members joining the business, and I think that is also something that uh, helps you to continue existing after so many years, is that you have to, even though it's a family business, you have to have 
professional structures and professional compliance rules in place so that the business is not managed by somebody solely based on their name but rather on their skills we were able to to do for all this time i joined the the company in in the marketing uh, on the marketing side uh, starting back in in our headquarters in germany uh, had a few uh, project based uh, trips in in, to, in our dutch sister company uh, before moving to mexico in 2007 where we had acquired a company there i was in charge of introducing the brand Wilhelm Boch in our bath and wellness division um, to the Mexican market. And then uh, just over two years ago, I joined in the U.S. team and moved across the border. Fantastic. Um, thanks for that overview, or specifically the viewpoint around uh, the family dynamics. Very, very interesting. Maybe you can give us a, a little overview of this concept of Villeroy and Bach. The, the organization uses the term the house of Villeroy and Bach as a means to tie together the different divisions. Maybe you can share with us a little bit of your viewpoint on how that works in presenting a unified image. Yes, quite right. As, as, you, as you mentioned in your introduction, we have three main divisions, um, whereas the, t- the decorative tile part of the business is actually a joint venture with a third party. But in our under our house of Ron Boch concept, we have two very distinctive uh, concepts, and that those are represented by the living space that we address. And that one, the one on one side is is the dining and the eating, the tableware side, and on the other side is the bathroom, the wellness, and uh, and you know the tiles also. Uh, with house of Ron Boch, which is a concept that we first launched for our 250th anniversary and have developed since several times, I think we are in the fourth generation now, on how to express it at the point of sale, is a concept to really address the consumer on a more emotional aspect in presenting them real-life experiences with respect to our products so that you don't focus on the individual plate or the individual wash basin, but look at the broader concept um, of and a huge array of products that stand behind the brand and, and which are offered in, in a design-driven approach. For the the tableware side, we say everything that goes on the layered and decorated table. It's, it brings in the, the flatware, crystal, silverware, table linens, decorative artifacts, everything really that is sold is um, living space under Warren Boch. In the bathroom, the house of Warren Boch really covers everything that you see in your bathroom, from accessories to bathtubs, water closets, wash basin, tiles. Again, we present this in a very unique way where the consumer can lively interact and, and experience these products. Well, you've done a great job in tying it all together with discipline, and your brand extensions have not strayed far. So uh, I know it takes a lot of discipline to keep it within its focus for the other challenge of being in business for 260 years. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit of uh, how does the organization look at and how has it evolved over those 260 years, and, and how is the brand, what is the brand's role in that evolution over that time? I think you, you pointed out a very important point, and um, this is actually a quote of our CEO and when it comes to branding a brand is not a democracy you do have to have a strict definition of a brand and you cannot have and this is what I also experienced in my different uh, countries where I've worked is you cannot have a different interpretation of a brand especially in today's global economy and global communication tools a brand has to have one single message and cannot have uh, different faces in different countries. Um, I think this has not always been the case for Wilhelm Boch. If you look at the history, we we have really uh, spent, I would say, the first 200 years being a manufacturer of extremely high-quality, design-driven uh, products, not always bathroom products because there wasn't running water, but for art, decorative artifacts, tableware. Those products really created an, an image and created an image for Wilhelm Boch, uh, which at the early stages was a manufacturing, an industrialized a manufacturing of clay products. And only over years, 
we evolved from focusing on the product and and the attributes that are directly related to the product and moved into focusing more on our brand, which by that stage had grown and had been fed by all these products and and experiences that that we have given it um, over over the centuries. In in the 20th century, we, we, we were at some point organized in a way where factories were actually competing among each other and where everybody had their own uh, interpretation on how products were supposed to be presented to consumers. And we soon realized that this is not the, not the future, it cannot be the future. And we were able to really transition from this industrialized production. I mean, the same attributes uh, were still valid at that point, but you know, we really combined it and bound it up and tied it around the brand, which in to the, you know, today really represents what Warren Bosch stands for. Well, I know you've brought together leaders in, in brand strategy to define exactly the brand. And we've worked with you on uh, really kind of localizing that for the U.S. market, but maybe you could give our listeners a, uh, a viewpoint on what the, the Warren Bosch brand does stand for. Yes, as, as you quite rightly said, you know, you, you have a core of a brand for Warren Bosch. It's the European culture the sustainability which comes with our presence over, over the years and over time and wanting to to be able to to have the same strong position in the future the inspiration the inspiration on our for, through our products or through our activities through our presentation through our communication and, and the confidence that Verambo has that this is with respect to being able to live with the time, staying relevant over, over time and being able to really captivate your customers uh, with the changes of the general trends in society. So those are the core the core values of our brand, which you then have to see, okay, how, how does this work in, in a certain market in, uh, for example, the U.S.? We will not change those core values, but you will be able to focus more in one, on one side or the other uh, depending on what's relevant to the uh, to the consumers in 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 the local market, uh, it was it was a, a quite a challenging work. It also there's a lot uh, associated with translating those values from one uh, language to the other, so that you know the values are understandable for people that you you present them to. You don't I mean there's a lot of cinematics that you don't want to miss uh, by having the wrong translation of of your values when you present the brand and and you want to make sure that things are not lost in translation but you have to go back always to the core brand and that you can apply subtleties to the different markets and and certainly you've had experience with that as you mentioned originally working in europe and then mexico and now in the u.s maybe you can describe some of the similarities and differences of, of working in those markets yes and 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 i think one has to differentiate a little bit here as well on you know target customer our premium brand and the premium position, the premium consu- consumer in today's world across the globe uh, are coming closer and closer. Uh, it really, they you know, probably will be differences between a premium consumer and a more mainstream or every, you know, for everyday product uh, consumer. I believe there are more, you know, regional differences in the culture and how to address them and how to make your brand fit into the into the market segment in in that particular region. However, for Wilhelm Boch, the the consumer really through the internet, through the the social media, through through everything digital, national culture is really uh, inspired through a lot of international forces out there. And a consumer in premium consumer in in Mexico, where I've lived, or in Europe, have many many similarities. And with that. Addressing these and, and using marketing uh, tools that they are available out there, they become more and closer and closer across the globe. So it's um, it's easier to to have a global brand when you are positioned in a in a premium segment and have a, and address it to a premium customer. Well, thanks for that insight. Uh, certainly, with your experience of working within these markets and, and managing the brand in these markets, you certainly have the global experience. And who knows, maybe uh, somewhere down the road, uh, a name like Von Bach will once again be at the uh, CEO helm, and maybe it'll be uh, Constantine. So I, <laughs> I hope that's uh, somehow in your future. Anyway, Constantine, you've been fantastic today. I, here's a few takeaways that I heard. 
I love the quote from the, the CEO in that uh, defining a brand is not a democracy. You can't have multiple u- viewpoints or interpretations on what the brand stands for in order to realize success, uh, yet alone global success. But at the same time, the brand's core attributes can be amplified or toned down to be to match a, a specific market, and, and you've been able to do that in, in the different markets that you've worked in. So fantastic insights on the viewpoint of a, a family-run business and how you've been able to sustain that for over 260 years, and then how you now have your own personal experience of working in multiple markets and, and uh, taking that, that global brand to the next level. So, Constantine, thank you for your time today and, and terrific insights. Thank you very much, Ryan. And if, uh, if any of our listeners would like to get a hold of you, is there uh, an email or something you can offer that uh, they could reach out to you with? Yes, they can definitely They can reach out to Veron Boch on our website, www.villeroy-boch.com. That's villeroy-boch.com. And my email is vonboch.constantine at villeroy boch USA.com. Well, you've been listening to another edition of Branding Business with Rika Spared. To learn more about our show, please visit brandingbusiness.com. You've been listening to Branding Business, the only show that brings branding experts and corporate executives together to explore how branding your business can improve both your top line growth and bottom line performance. To hear more, simply visit our website, brandingbusiness.com. Or tune in next week to learn how you, too, can build your brand and move your business forward. Brought to you by Rikus Baird.